Good morning, Newark Baptist Church, and welcome on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, we, as you can tell, are not uh, in the auditorium. We are once again downstairs, but we are diligently looking forward to next Sunday, uh, January the 24th. Um, we will be um, meeting in person uh, next Sunday. So for those of you who are able to come out for that, I'm really looking forward to seeing your smiling faces. And uh, for those of you who are not, uh, that will be live streamed. Um, our brother, John Haldeman, who passed away this past week, or should I say went home to be with the Lord, um, he, uh, we'll, we will be having his service here at the church uh, tomorrow. Uh, that is uh, Monday the 18th. Um, and visitation is from 9.30 to 11, uh, and the funeral service will begin at 11 o'clock. So if you can come and pay your respects, that is wonderful. If you can't, uh, you can pay your respects and let the family know that, that you are supporting them by tuning on to uh, Facebook and you or YouTube. Um, about 15 or 20 minutes before 11, that live stream will begin. So uh, keep that in mind. Remember them in your prayers. Uh, if you're not on our church uh, prayer group page, Newark Baptist Church prayer group on Facebook, I really encourage you to uh, go on and, and uh, to join that group and uh, stay updated on some of the prayer requests and the needs that are going on in the context of our church. Uh, we have so many people in our church family that are struggling right now um, with all sorts of different things. And uh, I think it's of the utmost importance that uh, we lift up, continue to lift up one another in prayer. Um, thank you for the hearing aids, by the way, uh, for the, um, the Snavelys. Uh, Brother Bruce Snavely is in uh, Liberia today and he's teaching classes on Bible doctrine uh, and so um, be in prayer for those uh, pastors that he is speaking to and what a, a amazing ministry that that is and uh, once again we have so many in the church that are struggling uh, I told our brother Roke Nag uh, his mother um, Emma um, she has pancreatic cancer and she's really really struggling right now and so I promised him that we would uh, we would lift him up in prayer uh, and there's there's so many others but uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer father I thank you uh, for the opportunity to open your word today and to be challenged by it father I thank you for Newark Baptist Church I thank you for the heart of of these people uh, father we lift up our brother uh, Roke uh, and uh, as he is uh, caring for uh, his his mom and 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 for Darcy as well uh, we pray that uh, your peace uh, in that situation and we lift them up to you uh, we have so many who are struggling right now and father I pray that you would help us all uh, to keep at the forefront of our mind that you are still on your throne and though our circumstances may change um, the reality that our hope is in you never changes and we thank you for that. We pray that you would speak to our hearts today uh, as we open up uh, 1 Timothy. And uh, we pray that you would challenge us uh, to be more devoted uh, to exercising our spiritual growth. And uh, Father, we uh, ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right. So if you take your Bibles with me today and turn to um, Acts uh, chapter um, chapter 20. Uh, we're going to be there uh, here in a little while. You can stick a, a little note card there and, uh, and then um, go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 is where we are going to be starting at. Uh, so here we go. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to start reading in verse number 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Um, we talked about this last week about these, uh, these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and, and how Satan has always uh, been a master manipulator of, uh, of humanity. 
Um, he has been able to time and time and time again uh, plant things uh, into uh, our thought processes and then we uh, voluntarily uh, do them. And um, also he brings in doctrines and doctrines of devils. What are they? It is anything that doesn't line up with the truth. A doctrine of the devil is anything that doesn't line up with the truth. And sometimes those doctrines may seem very close to the truth. And sometimes they may seem very good. They may seem, they may even seem logical, but if it doesn't line up with scripture, it is classified as a doctrine of the devil. And he says that these people, they're speaking lies and hypocrisy. They're lying. Now, if you're lying, that means that you know the truth. If you're lying, uh, that means you know the truth. And, and then he says, not only are they lying, but it's in hypocrisy. And so they know the truth and they're doing something different than what they are calling other people to do. And they're able to do this because their consciences are seared with a hot iron. They don't feel anything. They are, uh, for all intensive purposes, they are dead on the inside when it comes to feeling empathy or compassion uh, on the people that they are leading astray. And uh, Paul gives some examples of, of uh, how they are doing this. And uh, two of the examples that he gives are uh, they were forbidding people to marry in verse three, and they were commanding uh, to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And he's like, Timothy, here's two ways that these false teachers are bringing lies into the church and they're doing it in a hypocritical way. Uh, one is they're telling people uh, you can't get married while apparently they were getting married. And they were uh, also telling people that they couldn't eat certain things, but they were being hypocrites about it. And this isn't anything like new in the context of scripture. Um, you know, I, I pointed out last week that where Paul says here, now the spirit speaketh expressly um, that in latter times, some shall depart from the faith. We don't know if that's something that God specifically through the Holy Spirit gave to Paul just for Timothy, or if this was something that had came through the spirit earlier, maybe in some form of, of prophecy in the context of the church. But nonetheless, Paul, he, he says here that this is scripture, like this is from the Holy Spirit. Um, Peter talks about something similar in Second Peter chapter 3, um, verse 3, where he talks about, you know, there's a day coming when, when he says scoffers will come. And, uh, but um, Paul addresses this issue uh, in Acts chapter uh, 19 and 20. And I want to take just a minute and, and look at this. And uh, then we're, I ran out of time last week. And so I think this, um, this is important. Um, so Paul uh, has picked up this young man by the name of Timothy, and he has plugged him into the ministry and made him a fellow, a fellow laborer in Christ. And uh, Paul has given Timothy some humongous responsibilities. Uh, in, uh, in chapter 18, we find that Paul had, as you could look at this in 18 uh, verse 5, Paul had sent uh, Timothy and Silas to Macedonia, and so Paul had kind of sent him and Silas out on their own little missionary uh, expedition. And then they end up coming back and uh, meeting Paul while he is in uh, Corinth. And then Paul goes to, um, to Ephesus. And while Paul is in Ephesus, there's some crazy, which is where Timothy is at while he's writing this letter, by the way. Um, there's some crazy stuff that happens there. Paul spends three years there. He teaches in the synagogue. He teaches in this the house of this guy by the name of Tyrannus. Um, there's, uh, there's some miracles that are being done. People are being healed. Uh, there's some demonic activities there that uh, cause people to uh, be covered with fear. And uh, people are bringing in their, their curious, their books of these curious arts, like sorcery books or whatever they are, and they're burning them. And the whole place is just going nuts. And so Paul, then he sends Timothy and this guy named Erastus in verse 22 of chapter 19. He says, so he sent into Macedonia two of them uh, that ministered unto him, Timothy or Timotheus, 
and Erastus, but he himself stayed in, in Asia for a season. So uh, some stuff's starting to get exciting there at Ephesus. Paul sends Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia. And uh, long story short, crazy stuff happens in Ephesus and Paul uh, leaves. He leaves Ephesus and he goes to Macedonia, not without sending Timothy back to Ephesus where all this crazy stuff took place. And um, you say, how do you know that? Uh, first uh, Timothy chapter one, verse three, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mayest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So um, Paul leaves Ephesus, goes on this loop, and he sends Timothy back to Ephesus. And while Paul is on this last leg of this third missionary journey, he ends up coming back to Ephesus. Well, kind of. Uh, he ends up coming to this place called Miletus. Miletus is a port city uh, that's just a little ways away from Ephesus. And in, we find this in Acts chapter 20. Uh, when Paul gets there, he sends some people to Ephesus to get the elders of Ephesus. And Timothy would have been one of those elders. He gets them to come to Miletus to meet him. And the reason for this we find in Acts chapter 20, verse 16. And I'll read it to you. Um, he says, For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So Paul, making a beeline for Jerusalem, he wants to be there for Pentecost, which happens 50 days after Passover, and, but he doesn't want to go by without sending a word to those people there at Ephesus. So he sends someone out in verse 17. Uh, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Now, we've spent some time talking about this the last couple of weeks. Who are the elders of the church? The elders of the church are those who are in a pastoral role in the context of the, the church in general, but specifically he's talking about the church at Ephesus. And so he's in a rush to get to Jerusalem. And so he sends someone to Ephesus to have these pastors to come and to meet him there. And while, when they come to meet him, um, Paul, he gives them uh, a message. Um, verse 19, he says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the laying, lying in wait of the Jews and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but showed you um, and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews um, in the synagogue and also to the Greeks, um, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I didn't hold anything back from you. There is nothing that I held back from you, um, you pastors of the church at Ephesus. He says, I have told you everything that God has called for me to teach you. He's like, I've taught you everything. He's like, you watched me share the gospel with all of these people there around and about Ephesus. He's like, I taught you, but when I did, I did it publicly. I did it for going from house to house. And he says there was the, there there was always like these these Jews that were there that were trying to and looking for an opportunity to uh, destroy Paul or to cause problems for his ministry, but Paul says I've I've not stopped testifying to everybody uh, the repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says that now, in verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. He says, I don't know what's about to happen to me when I get to Jerusalem. Um, but he goes on in verse 24 and explains that it really doesn't matter. Um, he says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my count." I my life as dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course 
with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He's like, my life doesn't mean anything to me. He's like, I don't hold my life dear. He like, says, I have one goal. And my one goal is that I might finish my course. And not only just finish his course, but to do it, to finish it with both joy and the ministry that he has received of the Lord Jesus. Um, all those beatings that Paul endured, like all of those traps that the Jews uh, had laid for him, um, the, uh, the fact that like here in Ephesus, uh, he, he left in the first place on his third missionary journey because things got so crazy that if he had stayed, they would have most definitely killed him. And Paul says, my life, he says, I don't, I don't count my life as anything. He says, my life has, has no value to me, but um, he says, I just want to finish this course or this, this race, and I want to do it with the right heart and the right um, focus on the ministry that God has given me. And this is important. It's port important because, and we're going to look at, back at this race thing here in just a minute, the race that he says that, that he is running, but it's important because of the group of people that he's talking to here. He tells them that um, in verse 25, he says, And now behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So you've got this group of pastors that Paul has just spent three years teaching them in public and from house to house everything that they need to know about who God is and what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He spent all of this time teaching them. The church there in Ephesus is growing. And Paul, the guy who planted the church, um, there with, earlier with um, Priscilla and Aquila, this man is telling these pastors, he says, I'm, I'm leaving and I'm not coming back. And it's not because Paul didn't want to come back. Paul knew that God had something else in store for him and he didn't know what it was. All he knew was that they were not going to see his face again. And he, he, in verse 26, he says, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He says, I have shared everything with you that God has called me to share with you. He says, I haven't, I haven't missed an opportunity to share the gospel. I haven't shunned away from any of those opportunities. He says, I'm innocent of the blood of all men, and I have taught you and declared unto you all the counsel of God. And because of this, there is a humongous responsibility in verse 28 that is laid on the pastors of the church of Ephesus. A humongous responsibility. And he says in verse 28, he says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. He says, you have a responsibility to take heed and to watch your own life and to watch the flock, the church there in Ephesus, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He says, you need to take care of your, yourself spiritually. And you need to be a good overseer of the flock because this isn't just any group of people. This is the group of people that God has given you the responsibility to feed spiritually. And they are so important to God that he purchased this group of people with his own blood. That's pretty heavy. That's pretty heavy, but it starts to get a little bit heavier 
you see all of these people that are here, uh, they, they put on a, a good show. I mean, you could skip down to verse 36 through 38, and you find that um, after he had, had thus spoken, he nailed down and he prayed with them all, and they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. He says, there were a lot of them here. And when I told them that I was leaving, he said, they all just started crying and they started kissing me on the neck. And, and Paul was probably like, the whole thing was just weird. I don't know. But, but all of these people seem from this passage to be genuine about their sadness of watching Paul go. And I would think that, you know, if he spent three years of his life in any church, that the leadership of that church would be um, heartstruck when he left. Because literally everything that they knew had been taught to them by Paul. Here's where it gets a little bit interesting. He says in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul says, I know as soon as I am out of the picture. He says, I've, I've just told you, you're not going to see my face anymore. As soon as I am out of the picture, he says, there are going to be grievous wolves that are going to come in to the church and they are not going to spare the flock. They're not going to be kind to the flock. Um, when, when a predator gets into some type of easy prey, um, they don't have any compassion. I talked about my, my chickens last week. Um, I've found out twice that when a fox gets in the chicken house, it doesn't just take what it can eat that day. They go on this bloodlust, like killing spree, and they kill every chicken that they can get their teeth on. That's what Paul's painting the picture of here. He says there are, there are these grievous wolves that are going to come in and they're not going to spare the flock. They're not going to care about the well-being of the flock whatsoever. That doesn't matter to them. And who are these people, these grievous wolves that are going to come in and they're going to pull the flock apart. This is where it gets interesting. Watch this, verse 30. Also of your own selves, who are your own selves? The same people that were circled around him, weeping and crying and kissing him on the neck, because they were all doing that, saying, I can't believe you're leaving. We're going to miss you. This is going to be so bad. Why do you have to leave us, Paul? Paul says, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He says, it's going to happen. And not only is it going to happen, he says, some of you elders who are right here with me today are going to go back and you are going to teach some perverse, some twisted things in the church. And your goal is going to be to pull away people out of the church to follow you as your disciples. Seems a whole lot like a Judas type of a kiss to me. I was reading this this past week and that thought just popped into my mind. You got all these people falling on, on Paul's neck, kissing him, saying, oh, we're going to miss you so much and I can't believe that you're leaving. And Paul's already told them, hey, some of you guys, you're going to fail in the ministry. And not only are you going to fail, you are going to cause damage to the church and you are going to do it in a completely heartless type of a way. Doesn't that kind of sound like this group of people whose consciences are seared with a hot iron? They're speaking lies. They're living in hypocrisy. 
And those lies, those things that they're twisting, twisting things about marriage, twisting things about food, twisting things about who knows what area of life, they're doing it so that they can pull disciples away to themselves and so that they can gain whatever, notoriety, power, money, you know, the typical list. But Paul uses this explanation explanation or illustration here in a really interesting way. And so we're going to have a little bit of fun with this here for, for just a couple of minutes um, here in uh, chapter four. Um, one of the issues was marriage. The other that people were you know, causing an uproar with. And the other issue was food. And Paul takes this idea of food and he kind of runs with it. The, in, this entire next thought process starts with food, all right? There were people that were teaching weird things about food that didn't come from the scriptures. They were perverse and they were twisted. And Paul says here in verse, uh, verse four, he says, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, watch this, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. He says, if you can do this, Timothy, he says, you will be a good pastor, a good pastor that is nourished up in the words of faith. You have people that were teaching legalism about physical nourishment through foods and meats. And Paul turns the tables here and he says, you'll be a good pastor, a good minister, if you can, can yourself be nourished up in the words of faith, in spiritual food, spiritual food that takes on the form of good doctrine, which Paul says that Timothy, um, he says, whereunto thou hast attained. Timothy knew the truth. Timothy knew the proper doctrine, and he knew how to nourish his spiritual well-being. I would stop right there and say that your spiritual well-being, your spiritual nourishment, has far more to do with your life than anything physical that you do. You know, I, I've seen it time and time again where you know people have this list of things. Well, I don't. I'm a. I'm an okay Christian because I don't do this and I don't do this and I don't do that. But I do do this list of things, and you know. So therefore, I I am a good Christian. Paul tells Timothy. He says. You need nourishment, but that nourishment is a spiritual endeavor. There are lots of people that live, you know, good moral lives on the outside, but on the inside, they are completely devoid of any type of true spiritual nourishment. So number one, Paul tells Timothy, eat some good food spiritually. You want to be a good pastor? Get your heart right, Timothy. Make sure that you um, are nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. And he says, I know that you know what good doctrine is. And he says, verse 7, but refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. You, you see this thought process coming through. He was talking about physical food, but then he shifts over into talking about spiritual food and uh, for uh, spiritual nourishment. And then he tells Timothy, he says, refuse profane and old wives fables. And you say, well, what is that? Uh, a wives fable um, is something that something that is supposed as being true, a story that's told as for truth, but there's nothing that actually like backs it up. And like for uh, like in scripture, 
you might, you might, somebody might have like a little cliche saying that sounds like scripture and it sounds good. And maybe you even think that it's in the Bible. Like first thing that comes to my mind is patience is a virtue. Well, the Bible doesn't actually say that. Um, so it's something that's told for truth, but it's, it's spurious. Like it's not actually from the scriptures. And so Paul tells Timothy, he's like, you know, you know, the doctrine. He's like, I, you, you've, you've attained unto that doctrine. So he says, get this spiritual nourishment. Um, and then he says, you need to start working out. He says, Timothy, you need to exercise thyself rather unto godliness. He says, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of the life which is to come. Apparently, there was something going on there uh, at Ephesus that had to do with bodily exercise. And we might say, well, what in the world could that be? They were in Rome. This is part of the Roman world, the Greco-Roman culture. Bodily exercise was a big deal for them. Um, I mean, you don't think the Olympics were, you know, America's idea, do you? I mean, the, the Olympics started like back in, in Greece, back in like 776 BC. And they went on for like 1,200 years without even taking a break. And the Olympics uh, were, it was these, these um, acts of like speed and agility. They started off as races and then they turned to like where they would run and they would, you know, jump. And then they had boxing and all kinds of like fighting and all kinds of crazy stuff. And which essentially is where we get our idea of Olympics today. Like our modern day Olympics started in like the late 1800s. But you're like, well, why is this important? Because this was the Roman culture. The Roman culture was was about, for, for men, I mean, it's interesting. If you go back and look at like Roman statues of men, um, like the, the body image and physique of these these Greek statues or these old Roman statues um, really doesn't change a whole lot from like then to today. Um, it's kind of the kind of the same thing. Like the culture's uh, perception of what uh, women should look like has changed, but culture's perception of like the muscular structure of men, it, it really hasn't changed a whole lot. I mean, like you're not going to find any like Greek statues of, of Barbie. Like, you know, that's not the way that, that um, people uh, saw women as, as beautiful. Like, I mean, think about it. Like back in the day, if you married a woman that was like extremely skinny, like you might have a, a couple months where you don't have any food and she might like die, right? Like that, it just that wasn't their concept of, of beauty, but it really hasn't changed that much with men. And I think we can make a really good comparison to the, the world in which Timothy lived in there in Ephesus and the world that we live in today with this idea of health, well-being, and trying to be stronger and more fit. You cannot watch a TV show without watching a commercial, seeing a commercial about some new like weight loss program, some new energy drink, some new program that's going to make you faster and stronger. And like, it's just, it bombards our culture today. I believe that it bombarded the culture of the first century um, just as much. I mean, so many of the things that we have today came from that, that Roman, that Greek and Roman era, era. like the Colosseums that we have today um, are really the same basic principle, same basic layout as the, the Colosseums that were built by the Romans. Um, you look at um, you know, gyms that are built all over this country, like 
gymnasiums were actually a Greek and Roman thing. Um, interesting fact for you, uh, the word for uh, gym, gymnasium in the Greek comes or our word gymnasium comes from the Greek word, uh, I think it's gymnasio or something like that. Anyways, it just means naked, right? Like they didn't hide anything. Like whenever they went to work out and to exercise, they did it without clothing on. Um, the Olympics were done for like the first ever how many hundreds of years with no clothes on. Like they, they, <laughs> worked out without clothes and they they ran these races and things without clothing and uh, i found an interesting quote and you may have seen it before but it's uh, by by socrates or it's attributed to socrates and uh, socrates supposedly said this uh, no citizen has the right to be an amateur in the matter of physical training what is what a disgrace it is for a man to grow old without ever seeing the beauty and strength of which his body is capable of. And that is attributed to uh, the to Socrates. Um, it's it was their culture. We see this actually reflected all throughout uh, Scripture. Uh, in in the New Testament, you see this reflected in so many different places. Uh, Ideas that revolve around, um, Paul talks about fighting a good fight, running, uh, running the race, finishing uh, the course. Um, in Revelation chapter 4, uh, we, we see the uh, crowns that we have that we are going to cast at Jesus' feet. The word that is used there is the Greek word Stephanos, which is the same type, the same exact laurel crown that the, the winners of the Olympic Games would be crowned with uh, once they had completed their race. Um, body image in the Greek world, in the Roman world, it really mattered a lot. And so Paul uses this as an example for Timothy. He says these people are they're, they're focused on what they're putting into their body, what's acceptable, what's not, what the effect of this food is or what the effect of that food is. But he tells Timothy, he says, you need to be nourished up spiritually. If you are going to fight the good fight as and be a good pastor there in the church of Ephesus, you need the right spiritual food and you need the right spiritual exercise, the right spiritual workout routine. And he says bodily exercise profiteth little doesn't mean it's unprofitable, but it doesn't profit a whole lot. If you're doing a bodybuilding regimen, it's because you want to do a bodybuilding regimen and maybe Maybe it'll make you live a little bit longer. Maybe something horrific won't happen to uh, cut all of your hard work short. Maybe it profits a little bit, and I think we should take care of ourselves. But the truth is our focus, and he's telling Timothy that his focus needs to be on godliness. He says exercise profits just a little bit, but godliness which happens on the inside, is profitable unto all things. He says, if you get it right on the inside and you get a nice spiritual workout routine on the inside, he says, that'll accomplish something. Because that has promise in this life and in the next. In this life, it comes with peace and joy and also, it causes us to continue to run that race that God has called us to run and keeps our focus where our focus needs to be. I think it's pretty cool that Paul uses this as, a, as an example for Timothy. But as the pastor of Newark Baptist Church, I have to step back and ask myself the question, am I exercising in a way that is glorifying and honoring to God? 
And am, am I exercising in a way spiritually that is going to uh, give me the best shot that I possibly can have at becoming the man of God that God has called me to be? Am I exercising myself spiritually in a manner that one day I will hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant? Am I working as hard as I can? I've, I've known quite a few people that have gotten into the, the crazy like workout regimens. I've known both men and women that have got involved in this, and it is it is unbelievable to me um, when somebody really gets uh, gets to the place where they are they are they are dead set. I am going to achieve this physical goal, and they start hitting the gym. They start eating right. They're lifting weights. They're doing cardio. They're doing all of these different things, and then you start to see these results. And when you start to see results, like I always thought that was kind of cool. Um, I remember uh, this uh, one guy I used to work with, and uh, he he decided that he wanted to get buff, and so he ate all the time and he worked out constantly. And at first, I thought this guy's this guy's nuts, right? He's crazy. Like, why would he put this much effort into like trying to to you know get get big? And then he started then he started growing, right? His his arms started getting like stretch marks on them. And so me and all my friends at work, like we got all excited about it. Like, holy smokes! He is getting buff, and so we're like, well, we all want to get buff, and so we all like started lifting weights and things, and and uh, yeah, it didn't work out so great for me. Apparently, you have to keep that stuff up if you want to to continue to grow. But that's the point. That is the point. Anybody who wants to to attain to some type of 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 skill set. Uh, if it's a physical skill set, like if it's running, like Bolt doesn't just get up in the mornings and say, yeah, you know, I think I might run one day this week. It is his life. It is his life's goal and ambition to be and to continue to be the fastest man on the planet. From the food that he eats in the morning to his workout routine to the amount of sleep that he gets at night, everything is calculated. Everything has a purpose. These Olympic runners, even from the early Olympics, they've figured out real quick, well, we, we have to eat a certain way and we have to exercise. If we exercise like this, then we can get a little bit more um, a little bit more strength out of our, our body or maybe a little, a little different like appearance of our body. Paul tells Timothy, he says, the same amount of effort that you would see from a physical athlete, he says, you need to exercise yourself spiritually. It needs to consume you. Now, if, if we were in, in church today uh, in person, and I said to you, raise your hand if you know someone who has gone down the weightlifting bodybuilding routine and raise your hand, like all of you would raise your hand. And then if I ask you, um, by show of hands, like how many of you would say that it consumed, uh, like it consumed their life? Um, most of you would say, yes, it completely consumed their life. Like they had to think about every single aspect of their life to reach whatever that goal was. I always struggled with discipline when it came to um, physical type of like of, of working out. I remember in in high school I uh, I had me and my buddies after my the friend that I worked with had started getting big uh, we all started like lifting weights and um, as a freshman in, in high school I weighed like a hundred and probably like a hundred and 25 pounds and I could bench press over 200 pounds. And so I remember the wrestling coach comes in and 
he was like, holy smokes, do that again. And I think I got up like 225 pounds that I was, that I was bench pressing. And he's like, you're going to be on the wrestling team. The first thought that went through my mind was, I don't know that I want to put the effort in to be on the wrestling team. Like I have a bunch of different things that I enjoy doing. Like, you know, I don't want to stay late for wrestling because I, I want to go home and like, I want to go up in the woods and like, you know, hunt down a deer or a turkey or, you know, just do something fun, ride my four wheeler. Um, like I enjoy all those things. And I wasn't sure that I could, um, you know, do all the things that I wanted to do and join the wrestling team because those guys were devoted to what they were doing. Like, I mean, they, they wrestled all the time. They worked out all the time. They didn't eat when they felt like eating so that they could make weight. Like that just doesn't seem fun to me, but I had decided, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to join the wrestling team. And, um, somehow in a series of events, I ended up like tearing the, the lining around my heart and like getting air bubbles in and uh, like around my heart. I was hurt so bad. And, uh, so I told the coach, I'm like, Hey man, I can't keep lifting weights because I got something going on here. And as much as that hurt, um, I was so thankful that I had an out so that I didn't have to spend all of that time and energy preparing uh, to uh, represent our school in, in this sport. Um, I did a very similar thing with, with golf. Uh, me and one of my buddies, we said, well, we ain't, we're not joining the wrestling team. That's too much work. Let's join the golf team. And we put in just about as much effort in playing golf as we put in, you know, to uh, working out, which wasn't very much. And, and uh, needless to say, uh, we, we didn't get very good. If you want to exceed at something or excel, maybe that's the word, su succeed or excel in something, you have to put in the time and the effort and the energy. The majority of people that do the whole dieting thing, like the statistics behind like the failure rate of reaching dieting goals is just mind boggling because we just kind of stink at keeping up with stuff sometimes. But how dreadful is it for pastors spiritually to find themselves in that place of complacency when it comes to their own spiritual growth. I know I have, I've had rounds and bouts with this in, in my life with, um, okay, well, I will, I'm going to, you know, study this because this is what I have to, to get ready for Sunday, but I'm doing it because it's, it's a, it's something that I have to do. And that is, that's not the heart that I have the vast majority of the time, but we we're human and we aren't robots, but Paul's telling Timothy, he's like, you've got to stay focused and you have to stay diligent. And if you're going to be focused and diligent about this thing, he says, Timothy, it is going to consume every aspect of your life. For a pastor to devote himself to the scriptures and to be the man of God that God has called him to be, there is a humongous responsibility that cannot be taken for granted. We're going to skip down uh, here a couple of verses, and then we're going to look at that mid middle section um, next week. But if you'll skip down with me to verse 12, he says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in words, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. It's kind of like the idea of a coach here. He's like, you, Timothy, 
have to be the example to the believers in the church. He says you can't do the same hypo hypocrite hypocritical thing that these false teachers are doing where they're saying and commanding one thing of people, but they themselves are doing something different. He tells Timothy, he says you need to be spiritually nourished. He says you need to exercise yourself toward godliness. And you also need to ensure that you don't let anybody look down on you because you are young. You need to be an example to the believers in the words that you speak, in the conversations that you have. This is coming from the lips of the man who said, I would have you know nothing of me except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says to Timothy, he says, your conversations matter. He says in charity, he says, in the way that you love people, the way that you show compassion, selfless love to other, selfless sacrificial type of love to other people, he says, you need to make sure that you have it right on the inside because you have to set the example. He says, in the spirit, the power of the spirit in your life, he says, Timothy, you need to be nourished and you need to be exercised in that area of your life because you are the example in the context of the church. He says in faith, he says, Timothy, you need to be nourished. You need to exercise your faith and you need to be an example to the church about what it looks like to have faith in Christ. Then he says here at the end of verse 12, he says in purity, in purity, in a pure life that is genuinely seeking after the will of God, God's best, God's holiness reflected in your life, Timothy. He says you need to eat the right spiritual food and you need to exercise yourself because you have to be the example of purity to those believers that are there at Ephesus. And I have to step back and I have to ask myself the question in the conversations that I have, am I a good example to the flock that God has made me under shepherd over? In the way that I love, in the way that I, I show selfless, sacrificial love toward other people, whether inside or outside of the church, am I a good reflection to Newark Baptist Church of what God desires for a spiritual person to be? Am I a good reflection of the power and the control of the Holy Spirit, not controlling the Holy Spirit, but being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Am I a good example to that, to this flock at Newark Baptist Church? Would people be able to look at my life and say, Justin has faith and he is an example of that? What about the pursuit of purity in my life? Am I a good example of that? And as I spent a bunch of time this week thinking about those things, I found what I believe to be chinks in my own armor, in my own responsibility as pastor of Newark Baptist Church that I have had to set down and address. Am I nourishing these areas in the way that I should? Am I exercising these areas in the way that I should? That's kind of heavy. I guess the flip side of that is, if I am doing those things, are they reflected in the lives of of the people of Newark Baptist Church.
Paul tells Timothy in verse 13, he says, till I come. Now he told the people there in Ephesus that they weren't going to see his face again. But in here he says, till I come, whether he is Maybe Paul is thinking that he might have the opportunity to come. I don't know, but he says, until I come, he says, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. He says, Timothy, I'm not there. You are. It's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to set the example, and these things are expected of you. Read the scripture. Where? In his own personal life. He says, give attendance to reading, to exhortation or expounding that scripture, and to doctrine. He says, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy of the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Meditate upon these things and give thyself wholly to them that they profiting, that thy profiting might appear to all. He brings this, this exercise routine thing to, to a head here. He says, Timothy, all of these things are expected of you. You are the example to the church there in Ephesus because I can't be there. And he says, you need to read the scriptures. You need to exhort the scriptures. You need to, to teach doctrine. And he says, don't you dare neglect the gift that's been given to you. And what was that gift? It was the gift and the calling of being a pastor, to being a fellow laborer with Paul. He tells Timothy, he says, he takes it to a whole nother level here. It would be easy for me to say, I read my Bible. It would be easy for me to say, I, I study. It would be easy for me to say, I um I exhort, you know, by sharing the, the truth with, with others. It would be easy for me to say that I strive to, to uh, teach uh, doctrine, uh, which becomes a whole lot easier when I have people in the church who I know are going to call me out if my doctrine's not right. And John Haldeman was one of them. There's so many times that I remember meeting him at the, at the door and he would always in like a loving way say, hey, what? What do, you, what do you think about this? And I would end up having to like think through it for a day or two and then call him back and be like, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I get it. There's accountability there. But in this not neglecting the gift that was given to him, there's a very important part. In verse 15, he says, meditate on these things and give thyself wholly or completely to them. We get scared of this idea of meditation. Seems like some type of like mi Middle Eastern mysticism, like where you empty your mind and just, you know, hum and with your legs crossed and you just think of absolutely nothing and, and just like empty yourself of everything. Well, I, I believe that that is completely and utterly satanic. Paul tells Timothy to meditate, but not on nothing, but to meditate on these things. If you are reading the scriptures, but, at the, but you're not like thinking about those scriptures and meditating on those scriptures and asking God, how can I apply these scriptures to my life? How can I become a more faithful and genuine follower of Christ. Those things happen in meditation, in thinking on these things, on allowing these truths to completely consume you. I know it drives my wife crazy when whenever I'm like working on a, a, a message or, or thinking through like some like, um, passage of scripture that I'm going through on my own. And, and I just kind of like walk around the house in, in a daze. Um, and it's not because like, I don't 
<clears throat> love my family. It's not because like I'm I'm a space cadet. It's because like inside of my head, like my mind and my heart are racing at a hundred miles an hour, thinking on how can I apply this to my life. I've had people ask me time and time or tell me time and time again, like, oh, I I I read I've read this passage, you know, a hundred times, but I've I just haven't ever gotten that out of it. And I believe that um, those applications come through, yes, the leading of the Holy Spirit, but also a willingness and a desire to know those truths. Reading the scriptures is wonderful. Meditating on those scriptures and seeking God's guidance on how we can apply them to our lives is a completely different story. Many times uh, during the, the week, as I'm, uh, whether it's preparing for Sunday or preparing for our college group or youth group or just something that I'm reading and working through on my own, I, I find myself laying in bed at night just more or less repeating in my mind the, the passage that, that I have been reading. I just, just thinking through it. Like, what does this mean? God, what are you saying here? And Paul is telling Timothy, he says, when you start meditating on these things, what God has called you to do, uh, the, the um, spiritual nourishment, the spiritual exercise, it should have the same exact effect on your life that a workout routine and food habits have on a bodybuilder or on an elite athlete. It should completely consume your thinking. That's where our battle happens at, brothers and sisters. Your battle in this life happens in your mind. Your mind will try to pull you in one direction while the Spirit of God and the Word of God is trying to pull you in another. The battlefield happens in your mind. And if the battle is happening in your mind, then you're going to have to give something up somewhere. The most difficult messages that I have ever put together in my life have been messages that have coincided with my mind being in a different place. You've all been there. I shared with you uh, some uh, years back about uh, I had uh, started trading on on uh, on stocks I'd started a brokerage account and it literally consumed my thinking and it was awfully difficult to carve out time in my mind to be able to think on the things of God because every thought that went through my mind was what stock should I buy next? Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? What's the latest news? You got to stay on top of that stuff. And at the end of the day, I was completely broken. And what I needed was this message right here. Completely submit yourself to the teaching of God's word and let it consume your thinking. God doesn't just want a little part of you. He wants the whole kit and caboodle. He wants your whole mind. There's a war that's going on in your mind, but you have the, the power to cause everything to bow down to the obedience of Jesus Christ if you will just allow God the time that he calls for. My question to you today is very similar to my question to myself. 
as the pastor of Newark Baptist Church, am I presenting a honest picture of what it should look like to pursue truth, to pursue right doctrine, to pursue a godly lifestyle? Godly conversation, a right spirit, faith, purity. Am I painting a proper picture of who Jesus Christ is through these areas of my life? Paul lays it out here and explains that this is bigger than just Timothy. And this is bigger than just myself. It's bigger than just Pastor Brock. It's bigger than any pastor out there. What this passage is laying out for us, it's bigger than any one person. He says in verse 15, I'll read it again. He says, meditate upon these things and give thyself wholly or completely to them that thy profiting may appear to all. He says, you live your life on the inside of your mind and inside of your heart, completely surrendered to God. And he said, everybody who is on the outside looking in is going to see it. They're going to see the evidences of it. He says, it's going to appear to all. In verse 16, now watch this. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. He says, Timothy, he says, there's a lot riding on this. He says, Timothy, this is bigger than you. He says, you need to have right doctrine. You need to continue in that doctrine. And he says, if you will do that, and you'll take heed of your own life, if you were to flip back to, uh, to Acts chapter 20, this is the same, uh, same idea that Paul paints there. He says, take heed of yourselves. He says, take heed unto thyself and unto doctrine, and continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself. What is this going to save Timothy from? Isn't he already saved? We're going to talk about next week when the Bible talks about salvation. It doesn't always talk about um, salvation in an eternal aspect. With Timothy here, he says that he's going to say it will save thyself. Save thyself from what? From being disqualified. From disqualifying himself in the ministry. And also... He says it'll save them that hear. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. In Romans chapter 10, we find Paul saying that um, how can they hear without a preacher? I've seen so many pastors completely disqualify themselves from ministry. And we're going to actually look at here in a couple of weeks, Paul, or maybe a month or two, uh, Paul actually gives an uh, example there uh, coming up about how um, discipline should be carried out for an elder in the context of the church. But I've seen so many pastors just in my short time that have completely disqualified themselves. And that disqualification of themselves had a direct result on those people who were on the outside listening to the message that was being preached. The truth is, however, on a very similar way, in fact, in exactly the same way. You have the same responsibility that I have to live a life that paints a proper picture of what it means to be completely sold out to God. 
And though I, as your pastor, may have a platform to share the gospel and share the scriptures in a little bit of a different way from you, your life on an individual basis is the ministry of reconciliation. Sharing the gospel with people living out the faith. And a lay member can just as easily disqualify themselves from eternal rewards as a pastor can disqualify themselves from eternal rewards. Brothers and sisters, we have to be diligent. Diligent in ensuring that our pursuit of a godly life is not just some outward expression of what we think we should do, but actually an outward reflection of what is going on on the inside. How much of you is con controlled by the Word of God and the Spirit of God? How many of us can say that we are completely controlled by the Spirit? If you're out there and you're like me, you might say, well, I feel like I'm on a pretty good run right now. Spiritually, I feel the strongest right now that I have, I have felt in, well, probably ever. But that's not grounds for stopping. If you, you can go watch on Netflix some uh, videos, documentaries of bodybuilders. They have a difficult time figuring out and being able to understand when to stop. Um, because it consumes them. It's their life. But we as followers of Christ, it's a healthy thing to be completely consumed by the truth of God's word because it will carry on into the next life. Are we preparing for the next life, brothers and sisters, or are we completely focused on the life today? How much time and how much energy and how much of your thought processes, how much of the meditations of your heart are you putting in to knowing the one who created you and the one who saved you? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this word today. I thank you for the message that we have uh, to Timothy. And I thank you that Timothy was in the situation that he was so that we could learn from it. Father, I pray uh, selfishly right now, I pray that you would continue to speak to my heart and draw me closer to the image of your son. Help me to be the best and truest example of, to the truth of your word that I can possibly be. And Father, I pray for Newark Baptist Church. I pray that you would draw them and continue to draw them and grow them uh, into the image of yourself so that Newark Baptist Church can be the best depiction of the character and nature of your son that it can possibly be. But Father, we know that it all starts on a personal, individual basis. Father, I pray that you would challenge individuals today to open their Bibles and to beg you to speak to them in the guidance of your Word and your Holy Spirit. Father, if there's one listening today that doesn't know you, I know this probably sounds pretty weird. Being completely controlled by a book. But we know that this is far more than just a book. It is life. 
And Father, we pray that if that person today is listening in, that you might show them what it means to have life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for bleeding and dying on that cross for us and rising again glorious on that third day. Father, we are looking forward and anticipating that day that we get to see you face to face. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. God bless you, Newark Baptist Church. You are dismissed.